Welcome to Unmasking Humanity 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. I'm your host, Joshua, and wow, today is going to be awesome. Why is it going to be awesome? Because I've already done the broadcast, and let me just tell you, you are in for a treat. Everything you thought you knew about AI is about to get disrupted. Well, maybe not all of it, but a lot of assumptions or a lot of things that maybe you thought um, are going to be altered. The perception, that even the perceptions that I've had, and I like to, I don't call myself an AI expert, but I'm pretty well versed in it. I learned so much from this broadcast. I learned so much about this broadcast, not just about AI or generative AI, the future of education, working with governments, infrastructure, so much more. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have Dev Aditya here today, and I may have butchered that last name a little bit, but let me read you a little bit about him because he's the real deal. I mean, the real deal. And I'm floored by this interview. Um, I've never been so inspired for the future as I am now because of this interview. So here, anyway, Dev is an expert in generative AI from London, UK. He led the team that built the first digital human AI teacher with the mission to upskill 750 million underserved students globally by 2030. Dev was awarded by the UK Prime Minister for his work and has been a young global innovator and under 30 social entrepreneur. For research work in AI, he was recognized by Innovate UK and secured 250,000 in funding just in 2022. He is an AI expert with research expertise at the Alan Turing Institute in Brunel University, London. And his work currently is operating in 13 countries. It's actually 15 countries now. During the interview, he corrects me. But this is special. Dev is awesome. He's great to talk to. Um, answers every question very thoroughly. And it's all interesting. Like there's not a single answer that's not interesting and from the heart, and it's so informative. Uh, so thank you for being here. I mean, honestly, you may thank me for you being here after this interview, and I don't say that to do anything with me. It's our guest. Dev is incredible. You're in for a treat. Thank you for being here on the World's Mayor Experience platform that you can find at www.joshuatberglund.com. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dev to Unmasking Humanity, 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. And we're back to Unmasking Humanity, 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. I am so excited about this broadcast, getting to talk to Dev a little bit before I hit the record button. Um, I'm really, really fired up because I've been able to watch his TED Talk and some of his other lectures and just knowing what he's about has me so inspired that I have chills. Like I literally have chills because it's one thing to say you want to help people for a living. It's another It's another when you put a number on it. And we're going to get into that today. And this is going to be really, really special. You all are in for a treat. Without further ado, Dev, welcome to Unmasking Humanity 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. How are you today? I'm absolutely fine, Josh. Great to be here. And I'm really, really excited to do this with you. I am too. I'm really excited about this. Uh, before we get into the 21 questions, I would love to know, Dev, what are you grateful for today and why? Well, of course, I'm grateful to be here. But I think uh, one thing I want to really put out there is, as all startups do, as all organizations do, we sometimes get into positions where we have to go through the hardships to get you know, in front of the line. And we are going through that at the moment. And I'm really, really grateful to have the team that I have, that they are persevering through this. And I know this is what is going to lead to us hitting all of the goals that we have set together. I, that's great get, gratitude. That's fantastic. All right. You ready for your 21 questions? Absolutely. All right. Let's do this. Question one. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you became interested in generative AI? Yeah, that's an interesting question. If you just ask me that in one line, I think it's uh, rather funny. My original background is in law, but I, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> but, I, but I got into AI simply because of this. 
um, I decided not to pursue law after my university, uh, as many people do. And I actually wanted to get into education. And this happened because I was traveling across uh, South Asia with my co-founder. We were teaching marginalized school children, and we found there was a gap. And uh, this led us to actually creating Ottomans Institute, as it was the company in 2020. And we started upskilling a lot of mar marginalized learners, about 30,000 in the first year, year and a half. While doing this, we faced another problem. And the problem was we could not find enough teachers. And mind you, at that time, we were also in lockdown situation. So to solve this, uh, we thought, you know, teachers are intelligent. What's the closest we can get to mimicking intelligence? So to solve this, we thought, let's experiment with AI. So I have been hands-on with AI since then. Today, I'm a subject matter expert. I write in the field. I publish in the field. But that's essentially how I got in there. It's not something I planned to do uh, when I was a child. It was something out of necessity. And now it's probably the uh, thing that I'll be doing for the rest of my life. Yeah, because what you're doing is endless. The possibilities and the, the, the souls, the lives to pour into with what you're doing is incredible. Like, I, I'm... I'm glad that you already touched into part of the reason why I'm so excited to have you here. That's a great answer. Thank you. Question two. Yep. What inspired you to lead the team that built the first digital human AI teacher? So, yeah, as you said, I touched upon it. It was actually a necessity we had. But uh, for this question, I'll like, elaborate on this a little bit more. What we found in our journey, so in our first year, year and a half already, we were in about nine and then 13 countries. Uh, we were obviously servicing university and college students, but we were also servicing some of the most marginalized students in the world. Uh, we, by mistake, mind you, became the first digital education providers of college level in Afghanistan six months before everything fell apart. Uh, we've taught in Malawi, we've taught in uh, you know refugee camps in Iraq, et cetera. And the thing we found was, I think most people are focusing on the content. So uh, you're creating videos and text, et cetera. But content alone cannot solve the world's uh, education and literacy problem. It cannot you know, bridge the skills gap that we have. You need that teacher. You need that mentor. Just think about uh, first-time learners, for instance. How are they going to make sense of content that you give to them? Otherwise, YouTube would have solved the problem. Free books would have solved the problem. So I really believe that they need this AI uh, sort of teacher and tutor because there's just not enough humans to do that. And if we could, we would have already done so. Great answer. Love that. Thank you. Can you share more about the mission to upskill 750 million underserved students by 2030? Yeah, of course. Uh, that number is interesting. Uh, so quite a few people ask me about that number. So there are two things uh, that essentially drove us to this number. The first one is tactical. The second one is actually mission driven. So the first one is we've done our calculations. And our calculations are based on the current needy children and students in the world. It's based on the amount of people we need to upskill now. Uh, as you know, the world needs to upskill about 500 million people now in the next two to three years, also because of AI. It's based on also the rate of growth of the young population in developing countries and so on and so forth. So that has led us to this number of 750 million people, which is an actual number, not a slogan like a billion people by X. It's an actual number that we've come up to, and that's a tactical number. But this leads to our vision and mission. Because we also believe that that 750 million number with the target audience that we have, predominantly about 500 million who are sort of gen alpha is at the moment, if we hit that number, that's actually the tipping point. That's when we will become the go-to solution for the world. And then we further grow and continue to grow into the billion mark. So that's essentially why we target this. And it is absolutely almost, uh, you know, with religious dedication that we are trying to reach that target by 2030. I'm confident that you're going to accomplish it. Thank you. How did it feel to be awarded by the UK Prime Minister for your work in AI? It, it felt great. Um, it was a sort of surprise. Uh, I still remember 
got the letter in January of uh, 2021. So that was really exciting. It was great to be, you know, appreciated. Uh, whoever nominated me, thank you. Uh, but uh, I, I think more than myself, a lot of other people have been excited by it, including at that time, my landlord, he came and saw the letter and he was like, yeah. <laughs> so that, that was funny. Um, but I'm really, I, I'm really, really thankful for it. And I think more than, uh, you know, personally being excited by it, I think its most value is it has helped open doors for me. And that really matters because when you're on such a mission, uh, the more doors that open faster, the more you are able to, you know, press the gas. Perfect answer that translates into so many other industries as well. Yeah. I mean, even thinking about being a best-selling author, like, did it really change my life? No, but you know what? It opens doors. So like, <laughs> can't be too mad about it, even though I don't really feel the sense of pride about it that I thought I would. Like, mm -hmm. I thought I would wear a t-shirt that said I'm a best-selling author everywhere. And I'm like, as soon as it happened, I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Next question. Um, let's see here. Okay. How does being a young global innovator under, oh, I'm sorry. How does being a young global innovator and under 30 social entrepreneur mean to you? Um, I think a little bit of what you said, once it happens, it happens, right? I'm 32 now. So it, it's a little bit in my past. Again, it opens doors for me. More importantly, um, I hope that that inspires others. And in my current team of 20 as well, the majority are below 30. So I'm actually hoping with the work we do and other things that we look at, we have a few more under 30s coming out of our own team. So I want to inspire my own team. And I hope other people, especially from the developing world or young people that I come in contact with are also inspired by it. You've inspired me. Thank you. Can you elaborate on the $250,000 in funding you secured from Innovate UK in 2022? So at that time, it was something majestic. Uh, we were you know, absolutely bootstrapped. It was everything uh, we were funding ourselves. Our pre previous sort of business structure also was not uh, generating that much cash. So I think that was an absolute boon when it happened. That was one of the factors that helped propel us specifically from an AI development standpoint, because it was a budget to develop AI models. I'm extremely, extremely thankful for that. Where we are today, uh, it, it might seem like a drop in the ocean because obviously the needs and the expectations now are higher. But it's one of those uh, steps in the, you know, right at the beginning of your journey that you tend to remember for years and decades to come. And that's something I would probably remember for a very long time. Perfect, thank you. What kind of research did you conduct at the Alan Turing Institute in Brunel University, London? Yeah, so this is an interesting story. Um, so I actually, as I said, I got into AI out of necessity and then I learned hands-on and uh, I started you know, also entering the research community. After that, I got into a PhD in AI, not because it had to uh, help me in my career, but because I thought a lot of the work I do is product oriented. I need to be able to also hone my deepness skills, what I call, which is research makes you think deep, not just flat. So in that journey, I went on to Brunel. I became probably the youngest uh, of the uh, enrichment schemes of Alan Turing Institute because they normally give it for senior level researchers or senior level PhDs. I got it in my first year. So that was exciting. I And in terms of the research focus, what I focused on at that time was to build a real-time translator in sign language, particularly in British Sign Language. What that means is uh, with that, you can literally stick in an avatar. And whilst we are talking, that avatar is signing. Uh, and believe it or not, about 90% of the hearing impaired community have a glass ceiling above them when they have to consume digital content because it just doesn't exist, apart from a few channels here and there. Sure. That uh, MVP, uh, by the way, still exists. We have not been able to push it yet because of lack of investor appetite, because it is a small market. But we aim to push that with our own funds as we grow commercially ourselves as well. That's interesting. I'm going to make a note of that. That yeah, that's very interesting to me. How does your work 
in 13 countries influence your approach to AI and education? So I think at the moment we've just crossed 16, which is good. So we've obviously progressed. Um, any solution that you build, right? Um, if, you, if you're going to go tech first, you're just going to try and create something shiny without understanding the depth of the problem you're trying to solve. Hmm. So being able to touch and feel uh, the populations, the problems, the demographics of these countries is perhaps the most important fact here. It's not that we are serving there. Obviously, it's a good thing. But the most, you know, if I have to talk about the beachhead, the most important thing is me able to you know, being able to understand more than many other people, what does that student want in Afghanistan? What does that student want in the Philippines? What does that student want in Chile? What does that student want in the US? And that understanding for me and the team is very important in our mission, because otherwise, again, you're going to build something that's sort of flatlined, and it's not really supporting all the people it should be. One of the things that I've I've heard that I that I love that's happening with AI is for students, you can customize education to their learning style, but also their natural gifts and talents. I mean, I know in China, they're teaching kids strictly based on the, what they will probably end up doing with their lives. Like they're training them out of the gate instead of making them go through 18 years of indoctrination, like in the Western schools, or at least I'll speak to American schools. It's indoctrination. It's memorization. They don't care. It's a memorization test. Mm -hmm. And I know some people did well in it, but there was people like me who thought I was a dumb, I was a, an idiot. I thought it was dumb. I thought it was absolutely dumb for most of my life until I left school. And like, wait a second, I'm actually smart. And so when I hear things like this, like what you're talking about it, it really gets me excited because to me, this means everyone's going to have a fair shot at success because we were created with natural gifts. We are created with natural talent. And then, of course, we have our intellectual property of our life experiences. But being able to tap in that early means instead of having my heart broken and my dreams crushed as a child, now I get to step into my dream. I get to step into my greatness. I get to step into my talent. And I'm going to get the training and the teaching that's required to get me there much sooner. How, how far off am I? Uh, so you're absolutely right. Uh, so I wouldn't comment on China versus the West or any other country on this. But what I would say is, by and large, throughout the world, the education system has been one of the slowest moving in terms of uh, habitual change. Sure. If you look at a thousand year sort of period, uh, you know, the first 500 years, there was barely any change. Then there was some change. Then you had the printing press. You know, you had the sort of religious-based universities first coming, and then modern education as we know it is, you know, from post World War, right? So mm -hmm. forget about post World War, but even in the last fifty years, it hasn't really changed. And when we are talking about the MOOC platforms, etc., it's taken the same system, just digitized it by you know the Courseras of the world. So we are at the cusp of change. Uh, Theoretically, what I see this cusp of change, it's not even about AI. The real change here is this. We had traditional teaching, which was very limited access with some sort of interactivity. What I mean by that is you had to get into school, you had to travel there, you had to be able to pay for it. When you got there, if your teacher was good, you had good interactive learning. If not, bad luck. Then you had the digital era in the last 20 years where you could now access lessons right which were either accessible so i could sit in india or in the uk and access the lesson but it was not at all interactive it was one directional you watch a video or you read a text COVID came we had a little bit of a bump there where i could now do zoom lessons sitting in india or in the uk interactive yes but again not really accessible because it's in that hour in that day that i'm coming with ai generative ai for the first time today we can have both interactivity and accessibility in abundance right so that's the change and this can happen at a hyper personalized level it that teacher knows you more than any human teacher will know you as long as you've just learned with it for a year because it's with you all the time it's asking you questions all the time we have seen children tend to ask even adults actually we were doing some teacher training tend to ask more questions per hour to an ai than they do to a human because there is a lack of that shyness that barrier goes away so this system will also know you for who you are 
And in 2021 as well, this is pre-generative AI when we entered. I'll just give you another example. In South Africa, there was a learning system. We plugged in our AI there as a coach. So about 74% increase of uh, you know attendance in the platform happened. But that was not the most interesting part because we were expecting that. What we didn't expect was 75% people said that they now knew what to learn next on the platform just because the AI was guiding them, right? So these sort of things are going to absolutely change and shape the world. But I'll also be a pragmatist here because I'm always an optimist. That's my job. That's what I need to do. It will also create some issues because the way we operate in the learning space is going to be almost, you know, the majority of it is going to be screen time dominated. There are mm -hmm. certain problems with that as well. So we need to have checks and balances. But change is coming finally. And I think that's exciting for the world. Yeah, I love it because I part of why I'm excited about this is that the underserved communities are going to have an equal shot at success as everyone else, in my mm -hmm. opinion, especially yeah. when the infrastructure is built out globally the way it needs to be. Great answer. Thank you for that. What are some of the key challenges you faced while developing the digital human AI teacher? So I'm going to start this answer by touching on something you just said. Uh, I hope that's okay. Please. You know this infrastructure thing that we talk about? I'm talking 2020 when I started. Mm -hmm. Already, people don't have access to smartphones and the internet was already a myth. If you wanted to, you could find internet. And most people had a smartphone access. I'm talking about the remotest of the remotest places, right? They had uh, smartphone access somewhere in their community, if not in their family, even if they did not own it. So it isn't that there are people who don't have access to it. Today, that barrier has even shrunk. And the speed at which internet and devices are, you know, the device penetration is growing, it, it, it's sort of a, uh, you know, not even comparable in terms of trying to build traditional schools in every village in the world. You can never do that. And this is already, you know, circumventing that. So technology is going to be able to uh, really support this drive. So infrastructure is there and it's at a speed because it's the right infrastructure that we're now trying to use. Some of the challenges when we were building the AI teacher. Uh, I'll start with the first one. So the first teacher when we built, it was just me and my co-founder. We took a bet. Uh, we, we had support from two other individuals and we started building this AI system. Uh, and again, we didn't have that much of a clue, right? So everything was built and then we had to get the right data set to make it happen. We, we didn't have hugging face then. So where do we get data sets from? So I still remember me and my co-founder writing about 13,000 lines of question and answers in Excel and then giving it to the coders so they could make it into JSON to do that. So I think that essentially shows uh, what started it. And I think every week we face challenges. And that's just how a startup rolls, right? It's uh, You are extremely happy today. You've just had a contract with somebody like, uh, let's say, uh, the World Bank or whatever, and just tomorrow you've got a cyber attack or you've got something that's going on. So it's always an up and a down sort of a journey. But those who enjoy it really enjoy that sort of journey. Yeah, I'm all for it. I'm on one of those myself. So I, I everything you say about that, I'm like, yep, I, I can relate. I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you measure the success of the digital human AI teacher in upskilling up students? So we are a research-driven organization. So a little bit of a background as well. Apart from law, I am an AI expert. I understand AI architecture extremely well. My co-founder is a neuroscientist and a psychologist. So I, I think that sort of is already beginning. You know, you can see where this answer is going. So we not only look at it from a teaching and learning outcomes point of view or, or a tangible upskilling point of view, we look at it right from the uh, psychology level from the you know cognitive science level so the first ever research that we did for instance we looked at whether our ai teacher to begin with was human like or not did it have social presence in terms of what our users thought uh, was it competent in terms of the perseverance of the people that were looking at it did they find her warm etc so we look at a lot of what we call hci research human computer interaction research we of course look at teaching and learning outcomes as well um, and uh, there are a lot of other metrics that we look at. But the bottom line is, we are a research-driven organization. Uh, I still remember an investor calling us once, you're just a research lab. 
uh, you're not commercial, which we are now. Uh, glad to have proven them wrong. But we are always research first. And that, I think, is one of our strengths in uh, really trying to solve the problem rather than trying to sell something. I love that. Solutions, providing solutions. Perfect. What are the future goals for the OIAI project and other AI initiatives? See, OIAI is our flagship, right? So yeah. I, I'll just tell you a little bit about it. Um, we have our own fine-tuned 7 billion parameter model. Uh, so we are heavily research-driven on this. It's extremely important. We do not use the GPTs of the world. We want to give privacy of data. We want to control our own data. So there are tons of things that we are doing. But at a technical level, if I want to speak about, we are actually trying to follow a reverse pathway. So in terms of our products running on our own model, the first model was around 13 billion parameters. Today, our model is 7 billion parameters. By this year, it will reach about 1.5 billion parameters. We are not losing efficacy. And in certain areas, our performance is improving. You see, it's a reverse sort of technique than what other people are doing, which is purely on scale. If we can do that, it's also important. It's just not that we want to prove a point scientifically, right? We are also doing this because there is another thing that is very important. If you're just looking at chat GPT, right? You're paying 20 bucks a month just to chat with something. It's a very expensive solution. And if you're giving AI solutions out there, most AI solutions right now, because where they are in the technology curve is still expensive. We are trying to break that barrier because again, one of our core focus is to help the marginalized. We need to be able to break that barrier. The second thing is that will allow us to be edge AI oriented. So now we can run most of that model on somebody's phone. So if you are in a uh, sort of town for a day, you've had your updates on your phone. Now you go back to your village. It will still learn and it will still run for you because now it doesn't need internet for even if it's for just 10 lessons, because otherwise you would have always had to look for internet. So these sort of solutions are coming from these technical developments that we are doing. And we are hoping for that uh, alpha launch of the edge version of our you know, core teacher by November of this year. I'm, I'm speechless. That is amazing. <laughs> oh my Thanks. God. I have like 500 other questions now, but this is 21 questions, not 500. OK. Yeah. How do you see the role of AI evolving in the education sector over the next decade? See, my answer to this is AI is a new system of uh, operation, right? Um, it's not that AI is new. We've had AI from the 1950s. Um, everything that you've been doing from your social media to how you're targeted to your autofill uh, on your phones, everything is AI. Autofill is you know, an earlier version of generative AI. The generative AI in itself is actually a prediction machine. It's predicting the next word or the next letter. So AI is not new. But AI is a system change. What I mean by that is we finally had that tipping point in AI where now AI is for the layperson. The last time I checked the data, one in six people in the world have used GPT at least once. <laughs> you see how fast that is. We're talking about less than half a decade. So that's the pace of uh, AI entrance. It's just generative AI that I'm talking about, but AI as a whole. And because we've had both the layman experience of AI and the maturity of the technologies, now all systems are going to be run by AI. So uh, a very good way, uh, I heard this from somebody else, so it's not my quote, but I'll just reword it and say it. What's the difference here? Previously, we used to write code, right? Mm -hmm. And we used to write code to create something where as a human being, when I was a user, I went in, I could expect to have one of X outputs. So if I did this, this would come. With AI now, I can expect it expect to have one of n outputs. There is no sort of end to these outputs. Uh, so that's one. Like another product that we have, which is Teddy AI, it's in a very alpha state. In Teddy AI, what we have is a teddy bear that ch teaches children. But normally, a game has a uh, hundred or a thousand things that it does, right? In Teddy AI, it is unlimited. So one child can be talking about ice creams. One can be talking about Butterflies, one can be talking about football at the same time. It's unlimited. It's like talking to somebody else. Yeah. So that's the main sort of power of AI and how it's going to change everything. And from a technical standpoint, also, why is it different? 
as an engineer when we sort of uh, built in the pre era any product what we would do it we would have a sort of output already planned out we would write some lines of code and then we would optimize to get that output that we planned right in ai especially in generative ai what happens is you plant a seed that's what you're writing the code on when the seed starts germinating and becoming a tree you actually don't have 100% control whether it's going to fruit or not where it's going to fruit so it's a very different way of operating wow uh, both both for the user the experience is different but actually technically also it's different and some people might say that's slightly risky because there is a black box element but it, you know that is also what creates that magic so we we again need to weigh uh, the risks and the failures so good so much excellent information like this a lot of this is new to me i mean i'm hearing this for the first time learning this for the first time and not that i consider myself an expert in ai or anything but i do spend a lot of time learning about it and all the other future technologies but so much wisdom thank you thank you all right next question mm -hmm. what advice would you give to a young innovator or what advice would you give to young innovators looking to make an impact in the field of ai AI is a tool, even for the user, the teacher itself. Uh, we have humanized it because we believe that's the way of doing it. But even the teacher itself is a tool. So use the tool wisely. Use the tool as much as possible. And uh, not only in terms of trying to learn it, but in terms of trying to internalize it. That will make a lot of difference. You may end up actually creating a solution that's not with AI. But you might as well learn it because everything it interacts with will have AI. So yeah, that's going to be my two cents. <laughs> that's that's really good wisdom. It is an excellent tool. I don't think it's anyone's god, but I do think it's an amazing tool, and I'm grateful for it because, as somebody that has been an independent solo media company for the last eight years, mm -hmm. trying to do all the work myself, all of it, every piece of it, it was really really exhausting. Absolutely. And, and now because of AI. I've eliminated the need for eight employees. My process that used to take days now takes 30 minutes. Like, I'm so grateful. Like, I, I just, I'm grateful for the tool that it is for me. But this is, that's great wisdom. Thank you. All right. Can you share a memorable moment or breakthrough in your career that significantly impacted your work? I may have said this, said this somewhere else, but I'll just say it again because it's perhaps the number one uh, that links to my current work. Uh, if you remember, I told you about us writing those 13,000 lines of Q&A, et cetera. So it was, again, literally brain bashing and trying to make this work because we had the avatar going and we thought that was the difficult part. And then this became the difficult part and there was no data sets, et cetera. So we made that work. And after that, uh, you know, for that refined version, the first batch of students were about eight students in a refugee camp in Iraq, run by UNHCR and NBCF. And it was very difficult to get them together and they were learning from phones, but we literally are talking about Motorola phones and things like that, right? Still smart, but it works. And then we <laughs> ended up having some sort of a, a connection issue, Zoom came and went, but then we got through. And then, you know, we were just waiting to see if they could even access it on their phone. And suddenly there was this girl, I'll call her Aisha here because obviously I don't want to give her a real name. And suddenly she just looked at it and smiled to herself. And then she said in broken English to us, she speaks to me. So that was the moment I think that, you know, I'm going to take to my grave if you want to call it. And that was the moment we actually saw, okay, this is working like this, this it, it's not only working as a project, but you could see it in that person's eyes, what difference it can make. Mm, so good. So good. How do you balance your professional work with per your personal life, especially given your global commitments? Perhaps this is a uh, this is one of the answers that's not going to be what you expected. But um, being honest about it, at the moment I have no work life balance. I'm trying to uh, get a check on that. Uh, I had a little bit of success in it in the last quarter of last year. But again, things have just become extremely hectic. But hectic is good. It's taking us in the direction and the speed we want it to. And I'm hoping that uh, this sort of strenuous time sort of lags off at least this year so that at least 
the Christmas time is a bit more easier for me. No, I, I can appreciate that. If it wasn't, I have my moments of quiet are my quiet time in the morning and then the Sabbath, yeah. which that's my, other than that, I'm going to go as hard as I can go because yeah. there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of people like your, your number is 750 million. Yeah. Mine's 500 million. Mm -hmm. But, and it's for a very specific reason. I, I could sit there and give you an hour, an hour's presentation of why 500 million. I won't, but yeah, I get it. Like it's, it's like go time. Like it's, this is a really, really important time to be focused on what we get to create. So I love that. I support your lack of rest <laughs> or your lack of balance. Uh, I, I don't know if that's a healthy thing to say, but <laughs> it is what it is. All right. What are some ethical considerations you take into account when developing AI technologies? So obviously, uh, the boring stuff, we need to look at debiasing, etc. I, I fundamentally don't believe in 100% achieving that because anything you put into data, you know, any data you put into the AI is human generated. Anything that is human generated has a bias. It has the unconscious or the conscious bias of the people. So I wouldn't get into that part. I think privacy is very important to us uh, because we also work with children. Teddy, as I just told you, uh, we also work with a lot of marginalized people, vulnerable people. So privacy is very important to us. So how can we actually make it private? That's something we can control. Edge AI is also one of the reasons we are doing that. Most of your private conversations now remain and end in your phone. It's just not going to the cloud. So that's those are things that are tangible and we can control and we always keep it as part of our design thinking process. It's awesome. How do you ensure the AI technologies you develop are accessible and beneficial to underserved communities? See, uh, we build the teacher to be beneficial to everybody. And we work with universities. We even work, work with corporates for L&D and marginalized people. So it's, it's, it's not a one track thing. But, um, you know, Edge AI is one again from an accessibility standpoint. We've already touched on it. I won't touch on that again. Uh, even when uh, you know our current versions of products should be able to run on 3G, we always make sure that happens. Um, and also, I think everything that we do in the initial phases of our product development and research comes from the bottom up. So we do a lot of human-centered, uh, you know, user engagement, etc., to really understand what do they want. Otherwise, it's like you know waving a wand and creating something that you know is is not really fit for purpose. It's an excellent answer. Wow. All right. What role do you think government and policy play in the advancement of AI in education? Ooh. <laughs> um, I don't think the government was catching up enough. I think they're trying now. Uh, I'm talking at a global scale. Certain countries are doing more. Certain countries are doing less. I don't think it's a matter of AI from a government standpoint in this questions context. Uh, I think in this questions context, it is what can the government now do to really reduce the world's education, literacy, and skills gap? And do they find AI to be the tool? If they find that, because they have a lot of clever people there, if they find that is the case, then I think what they need to do is double down on it not sit there and debate it for another two years on what's the best way of doing that. If yeah. they don't find it to be the best possible way, fair enough. But if they think there is value in it, please go ahead and start you know, pressing the pedal because otherwise, again, we're just going to lose valuable time. And I'll just give you one example. Uh, this may not be this year's data, but certainly two years ago, every single month, 1 million people turned 18 in India. So that means that's the sheer volume of people who are leaving school age and getting into some sort of working age every single month just in India. So if you're going to take six months to debate when you already know that there is high potential for a technology to help these people, I think you should do it. Amazing. Good answer. How important is collaboration with other researchers and institutions in your work? Collaboration is important. I'll give you a very candid answer here, right? I'll go a little bit deep. So collaboration is very important here. I think some of the biggest breakthroughs have happened because people have been willing to share their research. Researchers and scientists always do that. That's 
uh, one of the hats I wear and my co-founder wears. Uh, companies don't do that. We've been doing it till now. OpenAI, etc., did it. And if you know, now they have stopped publishing. Google has stopped publishing. I think that's going to be a problem. Um, but there are also reasons for that, because also as technology matures, you also have friction between superpowers and countries. That's one of the reasons why uh, they may be stopping to do that. But I think collaboration as a whole has more to offer to society. And I think the entire open source movement, Lama 3.1 just came out from Meta, which is open source. Uh, yeah. They've given that out free to the world, right? And it's just beating uh, GPT and Claude 3. For those of you who are sort of geeky in this space, it's beating them, uh, these two models, in a lot of performance areas. I so, switched. <laughs> exactly. See? Yeah, so I switched. Think, and, and that's the value. That's the value that this can give. But there are, of course, risks. We have to be very, very open about that because you switched, I switched, somebody naughty may have also switched. So. <laughs> it's awesome. I'll, I'll save it. Okay. Can you talk about any partnerships or collaborations that have been particularly impactful in your projects? So the Innovate UK grant, that was obviously uh, one of the very important stepping stones in our journey that really gave us the first sort of capital push that we needed. Um, I'll just name two more. Uh, the UNHCR camps, that was the first sort of UN body that trusted us, uh, you know, with BCF in collaboration. Yeah. That led us, led to opening to UNICEF, etc. So that was, again, very important. We've also been supported by a accelerator called Dohe, uh, who, you know, give a lot of support for free. There is no equity. There is nothing involved. Really appreciate their work as well. And they are really dedicated in spearheading edtech solutions, again, to make the world a better place. Mm, so good. So good. What are some ways the community can support the mission to upskill underserved students through AI? What I would say is talk about AI in general. Look up on it and see where the benefits are. Uh, if you really want to support us, um, you can share our work. We are also always very open to talk to schools, NGOs, et cetera, to also support them. We do a lot of pro bono work as well. For instance, in Palestine, we often release our teachers uh, because the university system has broken down there. Students still need to study. So we are always there to help. Um, and uh, yeah, if, if just spread the word, connect us to people, and we'll be very happy to have conversations because one conversation leads to the other. And one of those conversations is going to lead to a very big impact. I'm not sure if I want if you want me to plug in the email ID here. Well, actually, what the final thing I was going to tell you, other than I have a connection for you, um, like a good connection, I believe, I would like to give you the last word where you can share anything you want to share. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, literally, if you want to share something for 30 minutes, that's your business. I, I don't recommend that, but <laughs> you can share anything that's on your heart. But the other thing I want you to do is to please plug where people can find you, where they can support your work, where they can invest, where they can reach out to collaborate, say anything you want to say. The final word is yours. Thanks, Josh. So I'll just keep it simple here. If you really like what we're doing, look us up on oiedu.co.uk. So oiedu.co.uk. You can always write to us at founders at the rate oiedu.co.uk. Anybody you connect us to, some value is going to come out of it. If it's pro bono work, we are always happy to do it. If it's commercial work, that's going to trickle down to some pro bono work later. And also, every single thing that we have done till today has been bootstrapped, and we have created commercial opportunities that has really allowed us to help so many people for free, apart from helping people commercially. We are just now entering into also our first sort of external race because we want to get deeper into the market and help more people. If somebody's interested in that as well, again, just drop us an email. Thank you so much.